Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our October Fellowship Assembly for Rotary E-Club of Canada One. And we're uh, going to get started this morning. We have an awesome guest speaker, so I'm going to call on our associate member, Kitty Buchko, to introduce our guest speaker. And if everyone could mute themselves, please. So, good morning, everyone. It's my very great privilege this morning to introduce Rotarian Neil Dunsmore as our guest speaker. I also had the privilege of hearing Neil speak to my Rotary Club last January. Neil's a member of the Fergus Alora Rotary Club in Ontario. And in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, Neil became aware that his community was more than two times the national average for suicide. And he felt a great and urgent need to raise awareness to get this issue in in front of people who could help to do something about it. And as a Rotarian, the motto service above self was very much on his mind. So on September 5, 2020, Neil began a journey in support of mental health and suicide awareness. He took the first steps literally to stopping the silence around mental health and suicide by walking 531 kilometers from the township of Centre Wellington all the way to Ottawa. Neil had been a township of Centre Wellington councillor, and prior to that he was a provincial corrections officer and a crisis hostage ne negotiator. So he understands the power of connecting with people, and he felt that the time was absolutely the right time to do this. So many people were struggling mentally with the isolation, as we all know, and they just needed to know that there are people and services available to help them. Neil's story is so very inspiring, and I know you will all be moved by his passion and his grace. So may I present Rotarian Neil Dunsmore. I could hear them before I could see them. But when I came into their view, everything changed. I realized they were organized. They were a pack. Oh, they sent the cute, cuddly one in first with the big brown eyes and the floppy cocker spaniel ears. Oh, and I almost fell for it. Hey, gorgeous, look at, wait a minute. Where are your friends? I looked around, I was surrounded. I looked back in it to see the largest one lunge for my leg. I barely got my walking stick in the way. And that's when everything went crazy. There were teeth slashing and gashing. There was growling and howling. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the dogs might have been making some noise too. Thank you, Kitty and fellow Rotarians. At that moment, I thought my 531 kilometer walk, my 795,184 step journey was going to come to an end right there and then. And it would have, except for two things. First, the owner bellowed from his balcony, here, now, and the beast bolted except for the Rottweiler. She stuck around. We locked eyes. And I thought, is this where it's going to end? The voice again said, I said now. And the Rottweiler took two steps towards her owner, stopped, turned back to look at me as though to say, you are lucky he's here. And then she joined her owner. Have you ever been so scared that your legs turn to rubber and you think, I can't take another step? That's when the second thing happened. My cell phone rang. It was my friend Norman from the Fergus Alora Rotary Club. 
Norm was thinking about me and just happened to call. And on shaky legs, talking with Norm, I kept walking. I walked and he talked. He talked and I walked until I saw my support vehicle. And the day was going to end the way I planned it. Not because of some dogs. I was going to finish it. You see, in that moment, Norman's presence in my life helped me push past the fear of that moment. In that moment, Norman's presence in my life meant everything to me. That became a common occurrence on this walk for me, all by myself every day, eight to 12 hours a day. But at some point, someone from somewhere would make a difference in my life. A few days after that day, was the longest day of the walk. I had been dreading that day. A tough 41 kilometer day. Even in training, I hadn't walked that far. So this day, I was psyching myself up and preparing for pain. And imagine the joy on my face when I showed up at the start and there was my friend Jane. And a couple of fellow Rotarians and Toastmasters who had made the decision to drive an hour and a half to meet me in the middle of nowhere just to start the walk with me. Oh, we're going to stay for an hour and then turn around. But not Jane. Jane brought her bicycle. Jane said, I can't walk 41 kilometers, Neil, but I sure can pedal that far. And just the thought of having somebody with me all day was uplifting because this was about the sixth or seventh day into the walk <laughs> and I was getting lonely. Having Jane and all of them there for the first hour was fabulous and everybody else disappeared, but Jane kept coming. She would ride ahead and she would come back and I kept walking. And then it happened. Round about the midday, something new something I hadn't experienced yet. My feet began to scream at me. Oh, the pain. It was unbearable. And that radiated to my knees and to my back. But I kept walking. Jane kept riding. You're going to be okay, Neil? We kept going. At the midway point, I looked down the trail. And at the head of the trail, to stop people from coming down, in cars and ATVs, they had put these concrete barriers. They were four feet high, eight feet wide, eight feet long and four feet wide. A tube, a concrete tube. And they stored stuff underneath them as well. But to me, at that point in time, that looked like a bed. <laughs> and so I made my way to the concrete barrier and I said to Jane, we got a break. Let's have lunch. I need to take the weight off my feet. And I jumped up on the barrier. I let my feet dangle. And then I laid down because my aching back needed to stretch out. I found myself closing my eyes. Ah. Suddenly, I felt a strange sensation in my feet. I opened my eyes. I looked down. Jane had removed my boots and socks. She was washing my feet. <laughs> and, then, and then she began to deeply, deeply massage my feet. I was a middle-aged man in the middle of the woods. I'm married and a beautiful woman was massaging my feet. So, I did what any married man would do. I took out my cell phone, I took a picture and I sent it to my wife. She's massaging my feet. The response was quick 
and brutal. Sucks to be her, dear, but I'm never touching them. Have a nice day. <laughs> but when I stood up again, oh, no pain. Jane and her magical fingers and that massage helped me to persevere. In that moment, I realized Jane's presence in my life at that point helped me persevere through the pain of this walk. Round about the midpoint of the walk, I had what I thought was going to be the end of the walk. It turned out to be my defining moment. The pain in the feet never left again. But I have two bad knees. My right knee is titanium and I had it replaced almost eight years ago now. The left knee is held together by chewing gum and bailing twine. It's just hanging by a thread and it started to rear its ugly head. And I was walking on a section of the trail that they allowed ATVs and hunters on. So the trail was pretty beat up. It wasn't like the trails I had come through already that were groomed. You could, they were actually handicap accessible, a lot of them. Not this one. And all the twisting and turning on my knee, pain was shooting up. Terrible. And the one thing I really dreaded being out there for 22 days was having to take drugs during the day. But in this day, I had no choice. The pain was that severe. I found a bench and I pulled out my Percocets and I took them. And I worried, what happens now? When they start playing with your mind to ease the pain, could I make a wrong step? Could I go off somewhere? And I made the decision right there that this walk is over. Nobody would think poorly of me. I, I, I'm about 20 kilometers past the halfway point. Surely people won't think poorly of me. And I reached for my cell phone to call my son and say, come down the trail and get me. You can actually bring the trucks on this portion of the trail. The old boy's done. And as I reached for that phone, it rang. And I looked down. And it was a good friend of mine, again, from my Rotary Club, Don Valerie. Now, Don has some unique experience. Both his knees have been surgically replaced. And I said, hey, Don, and it didn't take him but two seconds. And he said, what's the matter? And I said, well, I'm giving up. I'm, I'm in too much pain. The knees, the knees act, I can't do it anymore, Don. And he goes, Neil, you can choose to do that if you want. But will you do me a favor? Because you've been out there for a long time. You're over the 10-day mark. You're, you've been halfway at least. I said, well, I'm further than that. He says, good, stand up. And I did. And he said, look down at your knee brace. And I did. And he said, the hinge point on your knee brace, I want you to put your hand across your knee at the hinge point. And I did. And he said to me, I'll bet you a hundred bucks that that hinge point is below the knee. And he was right. And I said, where are you? Are you in the trees somewhere? Are you looking at me here? And he said, I know those braces and I know how much you've been walking. And I know the configuration of your leg is changing because your weight is changing. And that brace is probably shifted. And now your knee is working against the brace. So do me a favor. Readjust the brace, move it up, tighten it up. And I did. And then he just talked to me. We talked about what was going on in Fergus. We talked about things that were going on in his life. And I started to walk again. And he talked and I walked. Before I knew it, when we hung up, I looked down the trail. And I could see the road at the end. 
And my son was there waiting for me at the designated spot again. Again, a Rotarian who was thinking about me picked up the phone and he called me. And in that moment, his presence in my life meant everything to me. But here's what that moment did for me. I got back to the trailer. We had dinner and I went to sleep. And when I woke up the next morning, I had made the decision. If it's that painful, I'm done. But when I slid out of bed, there was no pain. The, the power of the human body to rejuvenate was incredible. And I knew that nothing could be more painful than what I went through that day. So let's get it done. And I knew mentally in my head, that's the day I knew I was making it to Parliament Hill. And I started out. And I have to tell you, that was one of the most emotional days I had because I was dealing with my own mental state thinking, I got this, I got this, I got this. Now, as I walked down that trail that day, I kept seeing bear scat everywhere. Blueberries on either side of the trail. Then I looked down the trail. And there it was on the side of the trail. Is that a bear? Now, going back the other way was two hours. <laughs> that way was an hour and a half. I'm not backtracking for nobody. Now, I had my high school outdoor education course, and I could hear my instructor's voice in my ears. Neil! Bears are more afraid of us than we are of bears. The key is not to startle them. Let them know you're there. Okay. <laughs> hey, bear. How you doing, bear? I'm here. Don't be startled, bear. Just mosey on away. The bear didn't move. Then I remembered, he said, make yourself look bigger than the bear. So <laughs> I took my walking sticks and I put them in my backpack. So I looked like I was seven foot tall. I even hung my vest on top of it. <laughs> look at me, bear. I'm huge. Come on, bear. You got to be afraid of me. Move, bear. Move. And the bear didn't move. Now they say, when you're fatigued, you can make stupid decisions. So I made one of those stupid decisions. I had bear spray because I was prepared. And I had a 14-inch hunting knife. So I took the knife out of the sheath. I took the bear spray from my holster and removed the safety. And I prepared for battle. Come on, bear. Don't make me use this. Just get out of my way. The bear didn't move. So I got closer and closer and closer. Now, I should probably share something with you right now. I usually wear these to see, but I had lost them in the trailer the couple days before so i've been walking for three days without my glasses i don't need them to see you guys here because you're only you know 14 inches in front of me so imagine the shock and horror on my face when i got close to the bear and realized it's not a bear it's a woman sitting on the side of the trail now, gentlemen, if you've ever been asked by your wife, does this outfit make me look fat? You know, there's no an good answer to that question. And I just called a complete stranger I had never met before a bear. I was afraid. Now, I may not know how to identify a bear in the wilderness, but I did spend 10 years working in a maximum security detention center. And one of the things I learned to recognize early 
is fear. And that woman was terrified, absolutely terrified. And when I approached her, I said, hey, are you okay? She didn't answer. I didn't want to scare her and it was COVID. So I moved to the other side of the trail. I took out a folding stool I carried in my backpack and I, I sat down. Now, a few years ago, I had the honor of coaching a woman in a Toastmaster speech contest who shared her story of abuse. And she shared with me some important lessons. And I used everything she talked to me about to make sure I didn't present myself as a threat and to make sure I didn't try to insert myself as a hero. So I rolled her a water bottle and she took it and she drank from it quickly. And I said, you must be hungry. And I threw her a sandwich and she ate it faster than I've ever seen anybody eat. And we sat for a while and I tried talking. I tried to encourage her. And finally, I realized she kept looking back down the trail from where I came. And I said to her, listen, whatever you're running from, whoever you're running from is back that way. I'm walking that way to Ottawa. Why don't you walk with me? Because whoever he is, he's not going to hurt you today. I won't let it happen. And she agreed. And then we walked. And then she started to talk. And she told me the most horrific stories I have ever heard. And remember, I spent 10 years in a prison. I've heard, I've seen some pretty bad stories. Eventually, I managed to get her to agree to use my phone and call a crisis shelter because she didn't want the police involved. We called a crisis shelter and we came up with a plan. And they sent a team to come and get her. And so we walked to a place where the road crossed the trail. And we were to meet there. The most terrifying moments of my life was at that trail where the road crossed. Because up until that point, I only had to watch behind me and in front of me. But at that point, I had front, back, left, right to keep an eye on. He could be out looking for her. He could come before they do. And she was terrified of that. So I gave her my stool and I put her in the trees. And I gave her my phone. And I said, if anything happens, you just stay there and be quiet. And you call for help. And then I sat down on the roadside, thinking to myself, Neil, if he comes before they, what are you going to do? What are you prepared to do? And I took the bear spray out and I had it between my legs and the side of the road. And then I realized I was eating my apple with my knife. I don't need a knife to eat an apple. But subconsciously it was in my hand and I was eating the apple. And then I heard the vehicle. My heart raced up into my throat. And this van stopped. And down came the window and this woman looked at me and said, what are you doing out here? That was what we had set up with the crisis line, that they would ask me, what are you doing out here? And the response had to be, I am walking to Ottawa to raise awareness for suicide and mental health. And if they didn't get that answer, they were to keep going. And as soon as I said that, she said, Mr. Dunsmore, it is nice to meet you. Where is she? And I got her from the bush, we put her in the van, and she went on her way. Suddenly the taillights of the van came on and it started to reverse and the door slid open and she jumped down. I have your cell phone. And she gave me my phone back. And in that moment, COVID be damned, we threw our arms around each other. And she thanked me. And I told her, this is all you. You made a choice. You've made the right choice. Now go live your life. And 
I never heard from her again. But when I got to Ottawa, I got a text message from the crisis center to tell me that she was okay, she was in treatment, and she'll be fine. And I could have ended the walk there, and I would have been fine. But there were still miles to go. And there were stories and events to have happen. And I'm just checking the time now, see where we are. We got time for two more quick stories, or are you guys tired of listening to me? Okay. So one morning, driving to the trailhead, I was staying on a farm with a friend of mine, our old university roommate, and my son was my driver. And on this day, it was the longest drive. It was the last day we were staying on the farm and then we were moving the trailer. So the drives in the morning would be shorter. So this was about an hour long drive. My cell phone went off while my son was driving. And I saw the name and I thought it's impossible because it was my name and number that came across the car panel to say I was calling myself. So I declined the call. And my son said, that's weird, dad. And I pulled out my cell phone out of my, my backpack and I looked at it and it was actually a Facebook messenger call. So I called it back and it turns out it was a relative who I've never met from Scotland. And he came on the screen and he said, Neil. And I said, Stephen. And he says, yes. And we started talking and it was my son who noticed it first. And he looked at me, he says, dad, is he crying? He said, yeah, I think he is. And as the conversation went on, I realized he was calling to say goodbye. And I said, son, are you planning on taking your own life today? He says, there's no other choice. Life's too tough. My wife left me. She took the kids. I can't find work. We're locked up with COVID. So I began talking with him about permanent solutions, the temporary problems, about getting help. My goal was to keep him on the line while I thought about what I could do. And he finally said to me, you know, one of the regrets I have is that we've never met. The family's never met. You moved to Canada and we've never met. And so I thought there's the connection. I said to him, do you want to meet my family? He says, well, I'd love to. I said, well, you make me a promise. I'll come when COVID's over. But you've got to be there. You've got to promise me that you're going to be there. And he did. And then he said, I have to go now. I said, okay. And when he hung up, my son looked at me and he said, do you believe him, dad? And I said, not for a minute, because it sounded like it was too emotional and it sounded like he'd already taken something. Now, does anybody know how to make an international 911 call? I don't. But what made it even worse was had I made the connection to a 911 international call, I wouldn't know where to send them. I'd never met the boy. He could live in the same town that my father and my grandparents grew up in, or maybe not. How do you do that? Well, he's, he, he's going to commit suicide. I need somebody to go to his house. Where is he? I don't know. It just it wasn't going to work. And so my son says, what are we going to do? And we were at the trailhead, and I said, I'll start walking, and I'll think. I got I to gotta get my head clear. And I got about a uh, thousand meters down the, the trail when I realized his dad had called me on messenger on my father's birthday to talk. He was my father's half brother. And I thought I never delete anything off of messenger. So I went into my Facebook messenger contacts and there was his dad's picture. But most importantly, there was a green dot beside his picture, which means he was online. So I hit the face and the screen burst open and there was my half uncle and he looked at me, he says, Neil, we've been watching your walk on Facebook. I said, never mind about me. Your son is ending his life. Get somebody to him now. 
and call me back so I know how it finishes. And then he disappeared. And I walked and I walked. And six hours later, my phone vibrated. And I pulled it out. And it was a text message from his dad. Thank you for calling us. His sister and the ambulance made it just in time. An international suicide intervention. I could have ended the walk there. And his father and I talked again. He said, the fact that you cared enough to reach out meant everything to him. At any given time, you can be everything to someone. Now, about two days before the end of the walk, disaster struck. I was coming down the trail and there was a swamp on either side of the trail. And with all the rain, the swamps had decided to meet across the trail. I had no idea how deep it was. I just knew it was 10 kilometers back that way to the nearest road. I'd come prepared for such an event. I had sandals in my backpack. So I, I jumped up on a rock and I started to, to change my shoes. When I heard an engine coming down the trail, this is a portion of the trail again where they allowed hunting. And I looked up to see this black truck coming my way. Oh, Lord, you should have seen the wake of the water in the front of his bumper. A big diesel truck pushing water out of its way. And I stood on that rock and I realized I'm not high enough. So I jumped on the tree that was beside me and pulled myself up a little higher as the water swished across the rock. And the truck stopped right next to me on the trail. And there was a man in the truck, looked just like me, too much snow on the roof. And he says to me, you walking through that? I says, well, is that the way to Ottawa? He says, yep. I said, then I guess I'm walking through it. And he looked at me and he smirked and he says, I guess you're getting wet. And then he drove away. I thought, prick. And then I prepared to put my sandals on and walk through that. And I just got them on and done up and the backpack back on. And I had my walking sticks to poke to see what would be under there. Snapping turtles, because I saw a lot of them, maybe snakes. <laughs> I prepared when I heard another engine. And I looked up and now here was a truck bearing down again and i thought great what is this the 401 i jumped up on the rock and waited and this time the truck stopped and it had one of those tinted windows that you can't see through and it came down really really slowly and it revealed a young man with a great big bushy black beard and he looked at me and he said what you doing bud i said well i'm walking ottawa what are you doing that for? Don't you know they got buses and trains to take you there? And I said, well, I'm walking to raise awareness for suicide and mental health. And his whole demeanor changed. And he turned to the passenger in the truck. He says, Jay, did you hear that? He's walking to raise awareness for suicide. And he looked at me and he says, well, that makes you a hero in our books. And around these parts, we don't let heroes walk through that crap. Jump in the back. Well, you don't have to tell me twice. I put my foot on the tire. I grabbed the edge of his truck and I propelled myself up over the edge and landed plop in a pile of dead partridges. Blood <laughs> and guts everywhere. I looked through the back window of the truck and he had a smile on his face. We had a good day hunting, bud. And then he backed up through the water all the way to a clearing. And he slowed down. And then I heard the passenger say, remember, there's another one about 500 meters up the way. So he kept going. And he took me past another large puddle. And then he stopped. 
And I put my boots and socks on and jumped down to go on my way. And I turned to say thank you to him when he said, what you doing for supper, bud? Take a partridge. And I looked at him. <laughs> I, said, I had the knife on still from the bear incident. I may have looked like I could skin a partridge, but I wouldn't know the price. I can't skin that. And I don't know how to, he said, I can show you how to do that. I says, I still got about three and a half, four hours of walking to do, my friend. Your carrying me through those swamps was all I needed. Thank you very much. And I went on my way. And I learned in that moment that even complete strangers can help you over troubled waters. Even the presence of a complete stranger in your life can mean everything to you at any moment. That's my message today. That 531 kilometer journey taught me that it is impossible for us to be everything to everyone. But at any given moment, every one of us can be everything to someone. Especially now that we're coming out of this mess of COVID. I want you to take a minute to think about your life, even this club. Who's missing? Who haven't you heard from? Who haven't you seen in a while? That name that just popped into your head? Pick up the phone. Give them a call. If you don't know what to say, start with, what you doing, bud? And let the conversation go from there. You may just find out that your presence in that moment means everything to them. Reconnect with people in your lives. If you're worried about somebody, reach out to them. The reason, the number one reason that people don't reach out to people they know are struggling with their mental health is because they're afraid. They don't know what to say. And they don't want to trigger them. Newsflash. You can't trigger anybody to suicide. They're either going to do it or they're not. Nothing you can say or do will push them that way. But I'm telling you right now, from my experience, reaching out and talking to them, that'll mean everything to them. You don't have to have the answers. You just have to help them get to the people who do. So reach out. Reconnect and risk being everything to someone. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I'm just going to stop the recording, uh, Neil, sure. and people can ask questions if they like. Absolutely.